Inflation is a terrible thing. Inflation you could tolerate. You could trade anything as a trend fall. When you think about Bitcoin, I don't think it's a currency. I think it's a commodity. Today, we're in an everything bubble. Genial and unflappable, even in the heat of a corporate crisis. That's the reputation of CS Venkatakrishnan. Known as Venkat amongst colleagues, the former Barclays Markets chief took over as chief executive after Jess Daly's abrupt exit in November last year. In his first TV interview since getting the top job, we talk about the bank's so-called universal model of retail, corporate and investment banking. So what are the challenges that lie ahead and where does he see opportunities? Will Barclays have to increase provisions for loan losses as a cost of living crisis gets worse? Over the next 30 minutes, we talk strategy, investment banking in Europe, the future of the city of London, and how inflation will change the banking world with the man who's in charge of Barclays for the last 12 months. Venkat, thank you so much for speaking to Bloomberg. So 12 months into the job, what have you learned about yourself and the bank? The last 12 months have been a wonderfully educational experience. Uh, about myself, I've learned uh, how much more I needed to learn about banking, including running a large organization, finding ways to encapsulate what our ambitions are, and to conveying it to so many people, and then visiting all you know, this global footprint of the bank we have. Um, it's also uh, you know, it's been a wonderful year in terms of the bank's operational performance. Mm -hmm. uh, we've managed a bunch of crises, and we've managed them relatively well, I think. Uh, but it's the start. We are in the middle of a tough e economic environment. So in terms of strategy, the strategy hasn't changed that much from your predecessor. Is it about execution or is it a, a different lens that you're looking at it with? So I was part of the team that set up the strategy um, seven years ago. And our strategy then was to simplify our footprint, focus on building a global investment bank that was you know, very highly competitive, we are now number six. We're the biggest European investment bank. It was about doubling down on the UK, where we want to be a leading financial institution in sort of everything, uh, retail and wholesale. And it is about building up a very specialized consumer business in the US, which we've done. We like the footprint. The businesses are operating well. I think now it is the striving to excellence, which is to make sure that in all the businesses which we do, clients and customers know what we are about, we do the things that we do very well. We don't have hobbies. We are very focused. We execute well. And it's about excellence. But can you really compete with the US bank in terms of, of having an investment bank? Can Europe have, always have that leverage, or are you always going to be one step below? So we are competing. Uh, we are number six. Uh, we've been gaining market share and share revenue share in our markets business uh, for many years. and. Uh, you know, we are under no illusion that we're not going to catapult, nor do we want to catapult to number three or number two. Uh, but we can be very good at what we do. Um, and if we are good, people will transact with us and work with us. And you can make a very good living at the size we are. Do you want to get bigger? Is now, if you look at the pipelines and things that are coming through, is now the right time to employ more bankers? Uh, Two slightly different questions about getting bigger. One is, I think, that as long as we do well and organically we grow, that's fine. right? I wouldn't want to take large steps. But if it happens in an accumulation over a period of time, that's welcome, because it's gradual. Uh, about bankers, uh, I think it's a question more about what sectors of banking. Mm -hmm. We've made a big push in sustainability, mm -hmm. and we continue to expect to do that. And obviously, uh, you know, pulling out of some old economy sectors or reducing it, not to zero, but there is a shift in the banking wallet, and we respond to that. And I think sustainability is very important. We were very lucky, fortunate to serve Con Edison, based in New York, when uh, they sold about $7 billion of renewables assets to RWE in Germany. It's one of the largest renewables transactions. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing we want to do and we want Barclays to be known for. Now, are you expecting more IPOs, more pipelines? You mentioned the environment that's a little bit uncertain at the moment. Yeah. What does the next 12 months look like? I think it is going to be a difficult environment for the first six to nine months of that 12. I hope by the summer, when people are able to sort of see the end of the rate rising cycle, uh, it may not have happened by yeah. the summer, but hopefully you can forecast the end of it uh, with reasonable confidence then businesses will feel more confident themselves in what they want to do about their capital raising and capital planning. 
but I, I think it'll do a little time before we see that clarity. What's your biggest concern out there on the market? I know you had some good results. Um, a, a lot of it has to do with also how you traded. Your traders performed very well, but we have a very uncertain environment. We don't know what inflation looks like, the cost of living. You have exposure to mortgage. W there's leverage out there. Yeah. What keeps you up at night? Well, I, I think what we've had this year is a series of incidents which would have been difficult to forecast at the start of the year. Yeah. Even at the start of the year, uh, I think across the industry, people were cautious because they knew we were at the start of a rate rising cycle. It's never good for credit assets in those periods. It's not good for equity assets generally in that period. Then you had the Russia-Ukraine war. And then here in the UK, you had that little volatility with gilts and LDI. So there are pockets where there could be leverage and there are pockets where there may be rapid movements. And in this kind of a rate rising cycle, you would expect to see that happen. So it's rather than being specific worries about certain things, it's being generally aware yeah. uh, that you're driving a car when it's rainy and the roads may be slippery. So what does that mean in terms of risk management? What does that mean in terms of you preempting some of the things that could go wrong? We, we have been operating through the year with relatively less risk mm -hmm. and what I would call relatively less long biased risk, meaning uh, expectations of asset prices to rise uh, than we would normally have done or had done a year or two ago. So we, uh, in, in the language of traders, we manage from a defensive position. Which means that things could still go wrong in unexpected ways or that you feel confident that you, you have this? I mean, you live through the financial crisis. Yes. And every two weeks somebody says, this is going to be worse than the financial crisis. This is worse than the 70s. What kind of crisis are we going to see and what does it mean for the banks? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't think, as far as the banking system goes, this will be worse than the financial crisis. Uh, I think banks are much better capitalized, but much better risk managed, and much more aware of the importance of doing that than they were back then. Um, and, and the regulators are also much more uh, intimately involved and engaged with the banks in, in understanding bank exposures. So I think it's not going to be like that. Um, I think from our point of view, and speaking, speaking for Barclays, uh, what we have to worry about is the impact on consumers. We are starting at a point where people are, uh, have strong balance sheets and, and employment is very high. So these are very good initial conditions. But squeezes are coming in different ways. In the UK, uh, to a greater degree than the US, you've got the energy price squeeze. Uh, and also in the UK, to a greater degree than in the US, you've got a squeeze coming from higher interest rates and mortgage prices and rents um, because it's more of a variable rate market. It's, a, it's a more of a fixed market than it used to be, but it's more variable than the U.S. is, which has a 15 or 30-year fixed market. Yeah. But you're not seeing that, right, in consumer spending right now. You're not seeing it in, in, in mortgages either. Is there worry that we're complacent and then at some point next year, early next year, it, it hits us hard? Not that we are complacent. But even though we've started off in a good condition, there are factors that are eroding that strength of the consumer balance sheet. Now, people are adjusting. What we see, what Barclays sees in the behavior of our customers is, first of all, a very, very small fraction. I mean, 1% of our people, uh, borrowers, are in any form of financial difficulty. It's tiny. Okay. Um, second is that we see people tightening their belts. Mm -hmm. They are being more prudent in their spending. They are. Uh, reducing non-essential spending in various forms. And all that's good. That's people managing it. Um, and we have not seen sort of noticeable signs of stress in terms of defaults, as I said. However, uh, I think we only know that these pressures could build, and so you've got to be cautious. If they do build, what will happen? What's best case scenario and what's worst case scenario? Could, could you see 20% you know, of zombie companies in the UK? Or is that too pessimistic? I think that's pessimistic. I think, uh, I think the UK economy has had a lot of support during COVID. And obviously, there are, you know, the UK has been growing more slowly than it should. Uh, but the financial services industry, which is a large part of the UK, is very competitive. But it's not the only one. Health sciences, even technology and parts of technology, fintech, are very, very bright stars in the UK. So the UK has a lot going for it. And I don't think you will see that kind of environment. I think what what, what I'm hoping you see is what people will call a soft landing and a shallow recession, helped by the initial conditions. Uh, and, and so what you might see is an increase in, in unemployment. You might see some credit weakness among, among customers.
but it won't be so bad that you see distress in society. However, it has to be managed carefully and it has to be managed aggressively with a balancing of the budget and that's what the Prime Minister has said in the last couple of days. Are you expecting a housing crash? I doubt it. Talk to me a little bit about the last six weeks. So you, you mentioned the guilt. I mean, was there a moment where you were in the office thinking like, I, you know, as Barclays, you're one of, of course, the players in, in selling and buying guilt with the margin calls coming in and saying like, I don't know what happens in the next two hours. So uh, first of all, I think that, uh, I think the, 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 the volatility was managed extremely well by the very effective, targeted, and time-bound actions of the Bank of England. So I think buying gilts, buying inflation-linked gilts, and then the repo facility that they put in working with the banking system uh, all helped ease the pressure in the crisis. And you know, you've got 10-year gilt yields now back below where they were yeah. um, at, the, at the day of the mini budget on the 23rd of September. Mm -hmm. As for us, I mean, we are large in the, in the gilts market. Um, what was important for us as we saw it was this was not a solvency issue at all for the pension system. It was a liquidity issue. And it was a liquidity issue because what was a very important feature of the UK pension system, which by the way I think yeah. is a good feature of the pension system, which is a matching of assets and liabilities, which employed leverage, created a liquidity problem. So a liquidity problem had to be managed. And the liquidity problem was managed by the government intervention or the mm -hmm. Bank of England intervention, the repo facility which allows people to borrow against assets rather than sell them, and by slowly releasing the pressure. And you know, so far so good. Do, do you think that, that will change actually regulations surrounding pensions in the UK? So uh, I don't know the answer, but I think what is important is that the UK pension system in aggregate is very well funded. It's about 125, 130% funded ratio, which is extraordinarily good, which gives it a good starting point from which to manage to a less leveraged future. Okay. Is liquidity your, the biggest concern for banks right now? I mean, we're again hearing, you know, the U.S. Treasury Secretary having to do things maybe to, to put a bit of extra liquidity or to, to pad it out in the Treasury market. So uh, bank liquidity I don't think is an issue. We've had liquidity regimes. The, you know, no. funding models are much, much more robust than they were in the financial crisis. I think part of what people are worried about and what they saw in the mm -hmm. gilt market was the liquidity in underlying trading, which is that these markets are not deep with, smaller bid with small bid offers in large sizes of trades as they used to be 15 years ago. And I think <clears throat> part of it, our banks are more prudent in managing their risk. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing, but it has a but consequence that, uh, that the big providers of liquidity have moved away from the banking system to the buy side. Do you worry about shadow banking? And is there any crossover? Does that, if you look at the system as a whole, if there's something wrong with shadow banking, does it, does it impact the big banks? Um, so it impacts the big banks. And by shadow banking, let's, I'll narrow it. I'll yes. narrow it to, <laughs> let's call fintech companies. Okay. Right? Um, so it impacts the banks in a good way and a bad way. So in a good way, what they've done is they've provided digital technology ways of giving services to customers, which customers like. And it's made us up, up our game, right? And faster than we would have otherwise. And shame on us for not having done it earlier. Um, now, when they go into credit, mm -hmm. which some of them have done, uh, they have less regulation than we do, which is perhaps not good for customers who deal with them, who may not get the protections they do if they, if they deal with us, uh, and perhaps not good for them if they don't lend with quite uh, the rigor and standards that more established companies might. On the second issue, that's a supposition. Let's see. Yes. So when you talk about you know shame on us, how are you changing that? Are you looking at fintech companies, and do you want to buy them? Do you need to grow internally? Like, what's your digital proposition looking like in five years? So uh, we are investing a lot in our digital capabilities. You know, the biggest bank branch we have, and most for most banks that's true, is our mobile app. Um, and we try to make it better and easier to use. Uh, the, obviously, it's always, we're half a step behind because we're working on older technology and with a larger install base, but we are catching up. And, and, and I, th I feel very proud of the applications that we have at Barclays to allow people to manage their finances. The issue on FinTech more broadly, 
is I think, look, some of the valuation dazzle has gone off yeah. uh, with, in the last nine, 12 months with the asset price corrections. But the core technology is good. And we continue to study these companies and study the technology and see what we can adapt. Mm -hmm. And maybe if the price is right, buy. What's your relationship like with with the new UK government? Have you had calls? Have you have they given you assurance about windfall taxes? Well, I think the government is brand new, uh, so we obviously many of the faces are very familiar faces, and we've been dead, you know in communication with them in many for many years, and we always are with with the government, um, and you know we await to see their proposals on on taxation, on fiscal policy, on all, all aspects of it. Where do you see the City of London being in, in four or five years? I, I mean, that's maybe too long a time frame. Should I say 12 months? Well, it's, it's both too long and too short. You know, here we are in the city. And this city has been the center of finance for 300 years. And it needs to be the center of finance for 300 more years. We certainly would wish that that were the case. Um, and it is the center of finance because of an excellent regulatory system, mm -hmm. uh, transparent, fair. Mm -hmm. It is there because of great availability of mm -hmm. talent um, and infrastructure, soft financial infrastructure and hard financial infrastructure. Um, and a part of that is also a stable, predictable taxation regime. So we hope that all those elements and ingredients remain and continue to allow uh, the city to flourish. And you know, the Prime Minister spoke about investing in education in Britain. And if you think about what drives the financial sector, I mean, you meet many of them. Uh, it's about the wonderfully trained people in the UK and the wonderfully trained people outside who are able but to come and work in the UK. I mean, the UK has lost something, or the city of London has lost business to other parts of the world in terms of you know, financial capitals. Yes. What do you need from the government today f for that to be reversed? Well, some of it is what others do, right? So once Brexit happened, um, and you could not passport financial services to London. All the major banks had to set up trading wow. enterprises in Europe. So that is irreversible, let's say, for the time being. I think other than that, uh, what we need is a continuation of what London has provided. You know, education, infrastructure, people, a great regulatory regime, and, uh, and a stable and predictable you know, fiscal regime. Uh, Venka, until not too long ago, Barclays had a, a, sh a activist shareholder on, on its back. Do you, th do you think about that? You always have to think about it. Uh, I don't think about it from the point of view of our business mix. I do think we have a good business mix. And that activist shareholder came because he thought we should sell our investment bank. He could not have been more wrong. I repeat it, he could not have been more wrong. The investment bank has been what has kept Barclays flourishing and quite apart from many of our competitors uh, in the fact that you know we performed extremely well during COVID. We are able to have a more diversified business model. Um, but I think for many banks like us where our valuations are low, you know, you've always got to be worried about what is driving bank valuations. What do you think will drive bank valuations? Is well, Europe overbanked? Um, well, so y Europe is, I'll, again, separate Europe from the UK. Okay. I don't think the UK is overbanked. Uh, I think part of what drives bank valuations, especially in Europe versus the US, is there is some worry about business model. Mm -hmm. I think in our case, we've got the right business model. And what will drive our valuation is solid performance, excellent performance, as I said. Yeah. Repeated, excellent performance. I think in Europe, uh, banking is still fairly nationalized. Not nationalized and state-owned, but, but by country. And I think, um, I think we have to see at some point the experiment of one large European bank crossing borders in a meaningful way, and then we'll know. When, when do you think that will happen? Do you think that will happen, or is it just a dream? We've been talking about it, I feel like, for two decades. Yeah, I mean, it's a question <laughs> more for the European bank CEOs. Yeah. Um, I think it should happen. I think, I think the test case should happen. And now is a good time. You know, when you go through a period like this, there will be some yeah. banks which will benefit from consolidation and ownership by a larger entity. Um, and I hope I see it happen. Uh, and it'll be good for Europe. So your bank is, is doing pretty well. Others are doing less well. We talk about Credit Suisse uh, almost day in, day out. Have you been able to, to get some business from clients that no longer want to bank with them? Um, 
Well, you know, business goes every way in the banking industry. Obviously, where Credit Suisse um, has pulled out of certain businesses, such as the prime business, we got some business from their clients. Um, but look, they announced a big restructuring. We wish them well. It is important for the banking system for there to be many players who are strong. Um, and I think, uh, you know, with this restructuring, hopefully Credit Suisse is on a good upward trend and, uh, and regains the prominence it used to have. Uh, Venkat, talk to me about some of the, the human errors, right? The, the recession that we've been talking about and how much that cost you. I know that there was also, I don't know if it's punishments coming or, or some, you know, steps towards the, the, the people that did those mistakes. Where are we on that? Yeah. So uh, we had an overissuance of securities in the yeah. U.S. It was completely avoidable. It is one of these embarrassing moments you hate to have when you're CEO of a bank. Um, it is, however, uh, it was a human error in a very narrow way. Uh, we have done both and had an external investigation on it, an internal investigation. We have made good by all the clients affected. Uh, we have had a settlement with the SEC. We cooperated from the first minute fully with all our regulators, and we dealt with the matter internally. We are in the final stages now where individuals who were affected or involved in this are being assessed. We've got a standard process by which we do that. And, and yes, there will be you know, implications for certain individuals, but that process will play itself. So by the end of the year, are we talking about job losses or bonuses, or can you give any more indication? It can be a range of anything. It can be, you know, uh, it, it, it can be letters to them, it can be verbal, uh, uh, verbal uh, feedback, and it can be up to and including you know, compensation or employment implications. Uh, you know, it'll take the next few months, it's, but the process will take its course. Uh, Venkat, I mean, through your strategy, we talked a little bit about, you know, the global economy. Um, do you worry that this wave of inflation is just going to get worse? When will we reach peak inflation? When will we know that we've reached peak inflation? You will know that the rate of change of inflation is stabilizing when the central banks start signaling it that in their rate rises. Uh, going away from 75 basis points, 100 basis points, to something more normal and natural. Uh, now, mathematically, there will be some forces that will bring inflation down, um, you know, just because base effects, as they call them. Uh, and I expect that will happen sometime in the middle of next year. Is there a danger that central banks messes up, that they raise interest rates too much? Uh, look, there's a f always a finely calibrated issue about when do you stop. Um, and I think many people have sort of raised two worries. One is that this is a, there's a sort of supply chain-led element of this. There's an energy shock element of this. Employment is at, uh, at all-time highs, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. and that people have not seen such a hiking cycle in you know, three decades. Having said that, I think uh, the officials are all across the world are, are all very, very experienced. Yeah. Um, and I think they will find the right way to calibrate it. If it how difficult is it in this, in this uncertain environment, frankly, to you know, calibrate where you want to grow businesses geographically in the world? Um, well, I'll speak for Barclays. You, we, we've got uh, you know, a real strength of the business in the US and the UK. Uh, we've got a good investment bank in Europe and a trading business. Um, we're headquartered in Ireland, but got a large trading presence yep. in France. And then uh, good presence in Asia, both in the Middle East and India. We've got an excellent investment banking franchise in Singapore and Hong Kong. I expect that footprint to remain mm -hmm. broadly as it is. Uh, we have some very interesting partnerships in Australia. We might do some others. Um, but I expect the broad footprint to be as it is. You know, the geopolitical uh, complexities, which are also arising, makes uh, people more cautious also about which countries yeah. they want to go to. H have you had to increase wages? For, and I'm not really thinking of the high flyer bankers, <laughs> but, but just to, you know, to match inflation in, some, in most of these places. Yeah, so we did a fairly um, large program of wage rises in India, uh, where we've got a large number of employees last year in 2021. In the UK, we did uh, an, an interim adjustment in August yeah. of about 4% for a lot of our workers. And then uh, we are working through another one mm -hmm. for the end of this year. And we did one in the US also late last mm -hmm. year. So I think inflation, especially as it affects
mm -hmm. um, some of our uh, you know, workers, we're going to have to look yeah. at it and we're going to have to respond. Um, when you look at the return to the office, I think you, you, bankers have to be back, what, four days a week? Yeah. How's that going? Um, it's, 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 it's going well. Look, I think we always have to create a balance. There's a level of flexibility that's come into work mm -hmm. life, into the workplace mm -hmm. since COVID, which I think is good. Um, I think some of the stigma from, uh, attached to working from home has gone away. And I think that's really important, especially for those who are managing young families or have other pressures that require them to spend more time at home or close to home. And I think we should continue that and should continue that in important ways. Some jobs require you to be in the office. Our trading floors are largely full five days a week, and that's the way it should be. Um, our bank branches here in London uh, also need to be staffed, and they should be. Uh, and uh, for some other functions, it can be less, but I do mm -hmm. think it's important for people in all functions, at all levels, to be in the office. This is an apprenticeship business at the end of the day, and it's important to have that productivity from being face-to-face. -face. Uh, Venkat, when you look at the strength in dollar, ham, ham, I mean, I, you know, this could be a shorter term. It could last for a very long time if you look at King Dollar. What does it mean for, for Barclays? Um, well, as a financial matter, it's actually good. Uh, we have about 40% of our revenues in dollars. We've got a fairly big business in the U U.S. More broadly, though, I mean, world economies will have to adjust. And that adjustment process can be painful. Yeah. And it's, you can see the pain it's inflicting in Europe and, and, and the U.K. Exports will be subsidized, but import prices yeah. go up. So it doesn't, it doesn't change your strategy in the, in the next two to three years about whether things, no. No, no, Nothing, no, no. Not no. At, the, at the margins or not really? At, at, look, at the margins, uh, we continue to like to have dollar-based businesses. I think it's important as a diversification yeah. matter. And also, as a realistically, you know, banking grows with economies. And the U.S. economy is doing better than some other economies in the world. So it's good for us to have that exposure to the U.S. economy. And we get it both in our trading and banking businesses and we get it in our credit cards business. And so we will look to keep and grow that exposure. Van Kat, thank you so much. Francine, thank you very much for having me.